Good afternoon, everyone. That was sort of low enthusiasm. <laughs> so since now is part of the day where everyone's flagging, so maybe we can have a round of applause for those who love books, reading, learning, literacy. <laughs> That's better. What better way to celebrate all the hard work it takes to put on this festival than that round of applause? My name is Anya Kreitney. I'm the programs manager at the Poetry and Literature Center, the official home of the US Poet Laureate, which is housed at the Library of Congress. If you haven't been down to the expo floor to learn more about what's going on at the library, I encourage you to do so before leaving. Today, we're hearing from two poets, Natasha Trethewey and Jenny Shi. The panel will start with a reading and will be followed by a moderated conversation. Please keep in mind Natasha and Jenny will both sign books between 3.30 and 4.30 in lines 9 and 10, respectively. So be sure to buy your books and get them autographed. Before we get to all the fun, I'll formally introduce our writers. Natasha Trethewey served two terms between 2012 and 2014 as the 19th Poet Laureate of the United States. She is the author of five poetry collections, most recently, Monument, Poems New and Selected, which was long listed for the 2018 National Book Award. Trethewey is the recipient of many honors, <clears throat> including the Pulitzer Prize, the Cave, the Cave Canem Poetry Prize, the Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters Book Prize, among others. Trethewey was also named Poet Laureate of Mississippi the same year she became the US Poet Laureate. She is the recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, today's stage sponsor, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, Harvard University, and others. At Northwestern University, she is the Board of Trustees Professor of English at the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. Jenny Shi is the author of I Level and the recipient of the Walt Whitman Award and the Holmes National Poetry Prize from Princeton University. She was also a finalist for the National Book Award, the Penn Open Book Award, and the Dylan Thomas Prize. Her chapbook, Nowhere to Arrive, received the Drinking Gourd Prize. Her work has appeared in Poetry, The New York Times Magazine, The New Republic, and Tin House, among others. She has been supported by fellowships from Kundiman, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, poets and writers, among others. Well, why don't we get down to the poems? First we'll have Natasha and then Jenny. Please help me welcome Natasha Trethewey. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. It's really exciting to be back in Washington. I'm just gonna read three poems to you um, to, go, to try to give you a sense of what I was trying to do in Monument. I was born in Mississippi on Confederate Memorial Day when interracial marriage was illegal there and in as many as 20 other states in the nation, rendering me in both law and custom illegitimate, persona non grata. In his memoriam to William Butler Yeats, W.H. Auden wrote, Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Likewise, my nation, my South, my Mississippi, with its brutal history of racism, violence, and oppression, inflicted my first wound. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. 
It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. The shared history of our nation, our struggles to live up to our creed, our ongoing struggles to live up to our creed, and my native geography are at the heart of this newest collection, my first retrospective. But the book is framed by the deeper of my two existential wounds that, when combined, hurt me into poetry. The need to make art out of trauma, both national and personal, the need to talk back, to articulate a calling. Imperatives for carrying on in the aftermath. Do not hang your head or clench your fists when even your friend, after hearing the story, says, my mother would never put up with that. Fight the urge to rattle off statistics that, more often, a woman who chooses to leave is then murdered. The hundredth time your father says, but she hated violence, why would she marry a guy like that? Don't waste your breath explaining again how abusers wait. Are patient, that they don't beat you on the first date, sometimes not even the first few years of a marriage. Keep an impassive face whenever you hear, stand by your man, and let go your rage when you recall those words were advice given your mother. Try to forget the first trial, before she was dead, when the charge was only attempted murder. Don't belabor the thinking or the sentence that allowed her ex-husband's release a year later or the juror who said, it's a domestic issue, they should work it out themselves. Just breathe when, after you read your poems about grief, a woman asks, do you think your mother was weak for men? Learn to ignore subtext. Imagine a thought cloud above your head, dark and heavy, with the words you cannot say. Let silence rain down. Remember you were told by your famous professor that you should write about something else, unburden yourself of the death of your mother, and just pour your heart out in the poems. Ask yourself what's in your heart, that reliquary, blood locket and seed bed, and contend with what it means, the folk saying you learned from a Korean poet in Seoul, that one does not bury the mother's body in the ground, but in the chest, or like you, you carry her corpse on your back. And this last poem is after a painting, Miguel Cabrera's Portrait of St. Gertrude from 1763. Articulation. In the legend, St. Gertrude is called to write after seeing in a vision the sacred heart of Christ. Cabrera paints her among the instruments of her faith, quill, inkwell, an open book, rings on her fingers like Christ's many wounds, the heart emblazoned on her chest, the holy infant nestled there as if sunk deep in a wound. Against the dark backdrop, her face is a wafer of light. How not to see in the saint's image my mother's last portrait, the dark backdrop her dress black as a habit, the bright edge of her afro wringing her face with light. And how not to recall 
her many wounds, ring finger shattered, her ex-husband's bullet finding her temple, lodging where her last thought lodged. Three weeks gone, my mother came to me in a dream, her body whole again but for one perfect wound, the singular articulation of all of them, a whole center of her forehead the size of a wafer, light pouring from it. How then could I not answer her life with mine, she who saved me with hers? And how could I not, bathed in the light of her wound, find my calling there? Thank you. Hello, everyone. I want to thank Anya for moderating the discussion. To come to the staff of the Library of Congress for producing a festival of this scale, and of course to Natasha, um, whom I'm tremendously honored to share the stage with. I'll be reading a few poems from Eye Level, which is a collection that is thinking through the intertwining of the seer and the scene. And one way that the book is having these themes come into focus is through poems about travel, about living abroad. I lived abroad in China, in Cambodia, and in Hong Kong for a few years, and being in unfamiliar places made me think about the porousness of the self, how much we are enmeshed in the landscape, and of course, of how our attention gets activated when we are in a place where we have no history. So this first poem comes out of those years abroad. And it's in sections. I'll pause briefly between the sections. Phnom Penh diptych, dry season. Motorbikes darting, nattering horns leave an aftertaste. I mark the distance on a map, this city a wrist width away from the last. Come sunrise, street dogs will turn their thoughts to wet foods. It's not easy to measure your life in debts. For years now, I've been using the wrong palette. Each year with its itchy blue as the bruise of solitude reaches its expiration date. Planes and buses, guest house to guest house. I've gotten to where I am by dint of my poor eyesight, my overreactive motion sickness. 9 p.m., Hanoi's old quarter, duck porridge and plum wine. Voices outside the door come to a soft boil. I sweat over plates of pork dumplings and watery beer. Can you fix this English? The Chinese restaurant owner asks, pushing a menu toward me. The men here chew toothpicks like uncles on both sides of my family. They talk with their mouths full. I translate what little I can. It's embarrassing. Just passing through, asks his eldest as she turns away to the fan. My guilt goes off then returns, wilder. For whom does it return? All I do is recede from the view of those at my back, heeding only the tug of the interior. It's not about the snare of need, though I forget why I came. Perhaps it's the shallow sleep in the subtropics, my youthful ambitions wet and slack. I wring them out. I want to remember this, though not with wistfulness. I hang my expectations out on a string. The city warms its tongue by not saying anything. Wooden spirit houses on the road to Kampat spray painted gold, capacious enough for a pot of incense, a rice bowl, one can of Fanta, noon, white hour, 
the outlines of bungalows in the distance, impossible to part the seen and unseen, what's here and what isn't. The language behind this language cracks open, and my questions follow suit. Months of medium rare insomnia, wine makes me confuse elation with clarity, and so I traverse the night market, my purse empty. There goes the moon, hardening on a hot skillet, all that is untouchable as far as the eye can reach. I thought I owned my worries, but here I was only pulled along by the needle of genetics, by my mother's tendency to pry at openings in her life. Calls made from a booth where one pays by the minute. I failed to mention the bite of my mistakes, furnish stories with movement, no shades of despair. No, I didn't travel here for the lawlessness. I developed an appetite for elsewhere. Beauty, too, can become oppressive if you let it, but that's only if you stay long enough. If you stay long enough, the heat's fingers will touch everything, and the imprint will sting. I kept twisting my face in bar bathrooms, in wet markets, in strangers' arms. And the years here, they broke through barriers, one by one, in a kind of line. Men and women came and went. The city was dry, and then it wasn't. I knelt to the passing time. The next poem I'll read has to do with a different kind of relationship to place and also a different kind of travel, that of migration. Um, my parents immigrated to the US in the late 80s and I followed with my grandmother in 1990. And this next poem is about how immigration shifts your point of reference, your frames of reference. Naturalization. His tongue shorn, my father confuses snacks for snakes, kitchen for chicken. It is 1992. Weekends, we paw at cheap silverware at yard sales. I'm told by mother to keep our telephone number close, my beaded coin purse closer. I do this. The years are slow to pass heavy-footed. Because the visits are frequent, we memorize shame's numbing stench. I nurse nosebleeds, run up and down stairways, chew the wind. Such were the times, all of us nearsighted. Grandmother prays for fortune to keep us around and on a short leash. The new country is ill-fitting lined with cheap polyester, soiled at the sleeves. And I'll finish with this one titled, Inwardly. The lightest realizations arrive in restraint, so the old masters tell us, not unlike the tug at the end of a line. We have a language for what is within reach, but not the mutable form behind it. Or else, why write? I'm sick of peering at the ego. No, my ego's tired of peering at me. It's she who awakens me into being. So it goes, the seer mistaken for the scene. Thank you. Well, thank you both for a thrilling reading. It was a pleasure to prepare for this panel and to read both of your beautiful books. Jenny, I'd like to start with you. You talked a little bit about the intent behind Eye Level. Um, is there anything you wanted to add before we move on? Is there anything you feel has yet been unsaid about seeing and seeing? Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> um, like I was saying, it's a big part of this book broadly, though it wasn't always intentional as I was writing the book, was this preoccupation with observing and being observed, and yeah. how strange it is that we 
call people into our line of sight numerous yeah. times in a day. We make them visible, which means we make them real, right. and we give them a form. And in return, throughout the day, we are made visible and real in all these different ways uh, and called out in all these different ways whenever we're in someone's line of sight, that we're different when we're with family, when we're in front of an audience, when we're with our best friend, yeah. um, and how those play out in, in um, the landscape of migration, travel, um, of being a person of color, and of course, how strange ultimately it is to move around the world stuck in a single body when we are so fluid and more than that. Mm -hmm. What is it about observation that makes us so capable, right? I mean, the book is so indebted to looking closely. What, it, what is it? What's the meat of observation that makes us tell our stories more attentively or carefully? Yeah, I love that. I mean, the, the power to observe, to perceive, to see, I mean, that's a power of knowing how to order chaos mm -hmm. into something, whether it's a narrative or your sense of the world, your understanding of the world. And when we observe, you're not just taking in the whole world as is. There's, that's impossible, right? You're constantly editing and revising. And I see, when I look out into this room, I will, my eyes will land on certain things that will be different from Tasha's, will be different from yours, Anya's. Um, and that determines how I think of myself, how I think of how the world operates. So it's a tremendous power. And it also, to be able to observe is to be able to fix another being or thing mm. in your sight, right? It was a kind of control. Mm. Um, and, and that you know, carries with it immense responsibility as well. Mm -hmm. Well, talking about control and inwardly, which you read, you wrote, quote, we have language for what is within reach, but not the mutable form behind it, or else, why write? Mm -hmm. And it's true, that does seem like the job of a poet, right? <laughs> I, I'll grant you that. But it also seems like the book, you know, read in total, seems to suggest something more, that getting, uh, this getting at what's underneath things is, mm -hmm. is a human thing, and it's almost compulsive, that, that we, it's a communal act, that we do it together. Does that seem right to you? Yeah, I love that you think of it as communal, because in many ways, um, this idea of seeing and perceiving, it's the ways in which we're bound to one another, how yeah. we get to be known by other people, how we know them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I think the book is very much invested in the unseen yeah. as well, right? All that we are biased not to see, and that is different from everyone because we all have different centers of gravity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what troubles us about what doesn't get seen, what doesn't get spoken about. So yeah. that is some of um, that mutable form, right, behind what we have a name for and what we can actually capture with our eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, this panel is in part about the poetry of place. And place is so critical to your book. And you gave a little primer when you talked a little bit about some of your poems. What is it about travel that helps us see more clearly, more expertly, more attentively? What, 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 what does it raise in us? What hairs does it raise? Oh, that's great. I think about that a lot. I think when you are traveling, um, that your attention, a different kind of attention gets activated, mm -hmm. right? And part of that, I think, must be because you don't, when you're in an unfamiliar place, you don't have a personal history tethering you there. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're, you're constantly paying attention to the landscape. You have to figure out how to situate yourself, how to process and map everything around you. And your brain is very much in the present when you're doing that, right? And there's something so liberating in that sense in that you kind of let the self fall away, mm -hmm. right? There's a self-forgetfulness, I think, that happens in travel because you're so preoccupied with just being and traveling and making your way around. So I think that's huge. And also, so much of what a lot of us experience in travel is through the senses, right? That um, things are heightened, that you take in a lot visually. Right. And we're, in some ways, primed to do that by mm -hmm. travel guides, by commercials we see, by movies, all of um, the ways in which we learn about a place before we even set foot in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you're, you're constantly on alert when you're traveling. I've done a lot of travel myself, and all of that feels right on in, in all of the various places that I've been. It felt very true to my experience. 
Well, what are the dangers of seeing, right? There, mm -hmm. When we travel, first of all, there's a lot of permission in who can travel and where and how long and all of, all of that. But then there's also this idea of being the voyeur. When you're somewhere, you're watching, right? There's, there's still this reflective thing of being seen, but there's also this eye seeing out. So how do we avoid, and I think one of the answers is, is in your book, mm -hmm. but I, I'm, I'm curious about how to avoid this gaze, this, this gaze of being the voyeur. Yeah, that's, that's really important. I think because you know travel writing has a kind of colonial heritage yeah. to it, right? Who has, like you were saying, the privilege and the power to go out, the mobility, right? And when you write um, about your travels, when you reflect on your travels, you know you are doing so from one vantage point, right? And you have to be careful of that power because oftentimes it can be the only, or one of the few narratives that goes out in the world mm -hmm. and is informing other people and readerships about yep. what a place is like yep. and who has the moral authority to say, this is what this place is like, exactly. this is what the people living there yeah. are like, um, this is judgment passed on a whole place with all its yep. complexity and irreducibility. Um, so in many ways, I'm, I think in writing some of these poems about living abroad, I don't know that I, I, I didn't want to be prescriptive or have um, a sense of this is the way you have to do it, but I was thinking about all of what made me a little bit uneasy about being this person, even someone who lived and worked in a place yeah. of feeling a sense of ownership. And I think I tried to turn some of the, the gaze back onto myself as a person with mobility and means who could leave mm -hmm. at any time I wanted to return to the States and work in the States um, and, and see that I, you know, I was aiming a very particular lens onto everything that I was catching through my eyes. I was not a neutral observer. Mm -hmm. Even the poem you read to us, there's this expectation that you would be able to translate the menu, and then there's a moment where it's like, well, I can't quite try. Yeah. You know, the, it's the, the rub between what is expected and what is real. And so I think you, you do it very capably. Throughout. It's, it's subtle, but I think uh, very, very effortless. You know, many of the poems, especially in, in section three, describe building a sort of selfhood. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the speaker here is ferocious, capable, insistent, but is also really aware that one is being watched. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how you relate to that and in terms of building a selfhood, right? How do we get this paradox of being seen out of there? You mentioned this a little bit, but can you relate it to the idea of selfhood, building a self? Yeah, I mean, when I think about some of what draws me to the page and to writing poetry, it is because in the act of writing, you are allowed a certain kind of unknowing, a certain kind of messiness and fluidity mm -hmm. um, that we don't normally allow ourselves or are permitted when we walk out in the world, right? Whenever I'm out in the world, um, there are all these images and labels and categories imposed on me depending on yep. context, what room I'm in, who I'm with, mm -hmm. and you can feel very constrained, right? Whether um, it's your gender, your sexuality, your yeah. race, um, your profession, and I think selfhood or, or something that I was interested in is interiority, which yes. is bound up in selfhood. Um, being able to get to this place where you feel very liberated that you don't have to just perform to yes. some idea of yourself. And I think that comes through, I think, the relentless questioning in the poems of always never settling in some fixed idea of what role you play or what self you have to occupy. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully, yeah. yeah. Natasha, I'm eager for you to join this conversation. And again, I want to congratulate you on a beautiful new and selected, it's gorgeous. Maybe we can start a little bit by um, your approach to the book, how you related to sequencing mm -hmm. the book and its arc. That's the part that I enjoyed the most, um, really? putting it together. Um, you know, because these uh, represents poems from about a twenty-year period uh, of my career, and um, you know, I, I've always written from the same obsessions, mm -hmm. and yet. Um, I noticed that uh, if I if I was giving a reading, for example, from uh, one book that was uh, dedicated to my mother from Native Guard, people would come up to me afterwards and say, "Well, do you ever write any poems about your father?" Mm. And then I had a book dedicated to my father mm. called Thrall, and I'd read from that, and people would come up and say, "Do you ever write any poems about your mother?" It was as if I was <laughs> somehow leaving yeah, something win. out, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, and I think connected to that was the idea of why I write. Mm -hmm. um, 
And because my father was a poet, it was easy for a lot of people to imagine that that was sort of the conduit, that I became a writer because my father was a writer. And I really wanted to set the record straight. Mm. I, I wanted to talk about those existential wounds. The mm. wounds are shared wounds of history. Yep. And then the, that personal wound, um, 35 years later, has not um, yeah. really abated. Um, that sense of loss. I've lived in a state of bereavement my entire adult life. Yeah. And I wanted to shape a collection that, would, even though it was about my engagement with history, mm -hmm. it was really about also this very, the way that my personal history was connected to that. Yeah. And so the two poems that I read last are the yeah. bookends. That's right. you know? yeah. I, I wanted to sort of begin with these two poems that say, this is the real thing that made me need to write. Yeah. That wound of history was there, but I don't know that I would have been really wounded into writing had I also not lost my mother. Yeah. And these things are connected, because as I mentioned, you know, that I was born on Confederate Memorial Day, mm -hmm. um, that my mother was murdered on Memorial Drive mm -hmm. in the shadow of Stone Mountain, the largest monument to the Confederacy. Yeah. These two things have always been connected, mm -hmm. and I'd always been working toward that. So in sequencing, I was able to really make that yeah. point. I, I yeah. hope I was. Yeah. Um, the books themselves, um, for, starting with domestic work up to mm -hmm. my last collection, Thrall, are presented in order, mm -hmm. but the poems in each book, uh, the order of the poems changes, yeah. the ones that I select. The only book that's there in its entirety is Native Guard, but mm -hmm. the others, often I began with the poem that ended a collection. Mm -hmm. And so it allowed me to create a different narrative arc um, mm -hmm. by starting there and moving into a collection, mm -hmm. the, the one that followed it in mm -hmm. another way. Mm -hmm. As you're talking, I'm thinking both of an opening and closing. And it's interesting that you read the opening and the closing just now in the reading. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, the, the, the opening poem is in a way about a misinterpretation or mm -hmm. several misinterpretation, well-meaning sometimes, of your mother's story. Mm -hmm. And then by the end, she's literally shining through with light, right? I mean, it's just transcendent, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder, did, and it sounds as if you're saying yes, that the book helped you put a course correction on what her her story was, yeah. what it meant to you, and of course, her, her own story. Is that right? Yes. Um, okay. It was a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, I've been living with that grief in a much fresher way yeah. um, recently, because putting together that collection at the same time writing a memoir, yeah. and in many ways about my mother. Mm -hmm. Writing that also helped me to shape mm -hmm. Monument. Mm -hmm. um, I found that the more um, sort of personal fame, if you can call it fame for a poet, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the more sort of my name was out there, the more um, my backstory, my mother was part of, but she was always an afterthought. Mm. She was also always mentioned as, you know, the murdered woman, yeah. as if she were merely a victim. That's right. And not the powerful, resilient woman who made me. That's right. So I wanted to correct that. Yeah. I got tired of other people telling the story. Yeah. And it also is about seeing and perceiving. Mm. I needed to mm -hmm. tell that story. Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 sh it shone through so beautifully in the way that you, you. in the way that you selected the poems. And I, I came away with, I, I think, a different argument than when reading them, the books individually. So it was really palpable. I think you were, you were quite successful. Thank you. You know, I think I, we, we've talked a little bit about this panel being the poetry of place, whatever that necessarily means. but. I was reading Monument, and because that was the brief, I was sort of tracking all these physical locations and, you know, as a way to visit all these other places in the country. And then I finally gave up, and I said, this is silly. Like, why, why, this is not the way to do this. Yeah. And then I thought, well, what's the root? Is, is there one root? I kept turning the whole thing to pick some, new, some newer thread that was going back, you know, millennia, centuries, mm -hmm. you know, centuries and centuries. Does it feel like there's a single root, or, or is that a misnomer? Is, mm. what, what feels palpable? Well, you know, I, I, I think for me, I, I take it back to um, um, 
Ralph Ellison's revision of Heraclitus's axiom, mm. uh, character is fate to geography is fate. Yeah. And the geography into which I was born, mm -hmm. uh, the Deep South, yeah. Mississippi, on Confederate Memorial Day, yeah. it, it felt like um, it is a kind of destiny. Um, when you're given a particular history, you inherit yeah. the history of the place, mm -hmm. um, of the people there. Um, you are both inside of it, and I think if you're lucky, able to step outside and, mm. and, and look at your place in this particular history. Yeah. So that is very much the root for yeah. me. It's the lens through which, you know, I see um, the rest of the nation. And in many ways, you know, Mississippi is certainly a microcosm for yeah. looking at the rest of the yeah. nation. Yeah. Our, our troubles, our wounds are the nation's wounds. That's right. Yeah. So the business with seeing, the trouble with this seeing, once we've seen Mississippi, what do we do? It's funny, this morning I was reading ex excerpts from the, the 1619 Project, um, and then again thinking of your book, Monument, right? What to do with these types of monuments. And then I was thinking of sort of twin poems in the, in the book, um, Graveyard Blues, and then also a monument. And so in one poem, there is a physical marker mm -hmm. for your mother, and another, there's an absence of a physical marker. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what to do? What, what is it that we need? What, in, ter in terms of the, the reckoning that this country do, requires, do we, do we need these physical landmarks as well as abstract ones? What do you think? Where do you come down on this idea of monuments, phys physical, physical or abstract? Oh, I, I, I do think that we need both. Um, I think that there are some people, um, for a long time believed that the physical monuments, those stone markers that are in various places, you know, in little town squares all across the country with some text written on them, um, a lot of people have thought that those things were sort of lifeless yeah. because, you know, once you inscribe it in stone, it's dead, mm -hmm. it's graven, it's, it's perfect, it's unchanging. Um, I never believed that because yeah. I believe that any time you know, someone stops and pays attention to yeah. one of those monuments, it's reanimated in the imagination of the person who's reading it, engaged in the landscape. Um, if people thought that before, after Charlottesville, I think it's impossible yeah. Yeah. to think that these monuments haven't been meaning something. That's right. And have not been simply a dead issue. Mm -hmm they have lived on and they have told us various competing narratives. And I think that we both need um, things to mark certain places to tell us lest we forget. I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm thinking about this because I was just in Mississippi last week um, and I spent an afternoon driving around to all of the sites that were connected to Emmett Till's abduction and murder. Mm -hmm. And they have begun to put markers there, and yeah. perhaps many of you know that the monument, uh, the big marker that they put um, at the river over the Tallahatchie mm -hmm. has been shot up mm. um, again and again. BB guns, mm. other kinds of guns, uh, people, it, t to think that it angers some people enough that yeah. they want to deface it. I know. Um, but the people um, at the uh, Emmett Till Interpretive Center are determined to mark that site so that we don't ever forget mm -hmm. uh, Emmett Till and what he means to us then and now. Mm -hmm. um, so now they're going to get a, a sign that's bulletproof. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and it will be there Good. to remind us. Good. But I do think also with there are monuments that need uh, contextualization. Mm -hmm. You know, and, I, and I, I'm afraid that um, you know, when people don't know the history of when a monument was erected or why it was erected, mm -hmm. then they're missing the story. I think we need to tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're saying place is somewhat of a placeholder for history mm -hmm. and that we can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. It'd be silly to have one without the other. Well, I'll ask one more question of you, Natasha, and then I'll open it up. You write a lot of poems that could be described as ekphrastic, that are, that are dependent on or um, in service of something visual. Can you describe, can you tell us that relationship for you, what it opens in mm -hmm. your mind? 
You know, I started writing poems about art by writing poems about photographs um, mm. early on. I was interested in um, that given frame of image. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in it both as just the pure image itself and the juxtaposition of people and objects within and the kinds of narratives that are suggested yeah. by those uh, interactions. I was also interested in them as historical artifacts, mm -hmm. um, the way that we can think about what happened um, outside of the frame that's invisible to us, what happened just before or yeah. just after, the way that looking at a photograph, we're looking at a moment that is no longer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the people in it are no longer. And there's yeah. ways that we know something about that historical moment and the people in it that they didn't know at yeah. that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and because of all those opportunities um, to get at what is beyond the frame and behind it, um, I moved from photographs to looking at um, other works of art, mm -hmm. mostly Paint paintings. paintings yeah. And I think of also paintings as a way um, into the particular history of a time and place. I mean, the, the, the art being made is telling us something about yeah. the historical moment mm -hmm. um, and also is a kind of framing, mm -hmm. um, what is there and what is not there. Mm -hmm. Jenny, I'm going to ask you a version of the same question, in part because as I was reading, I felt, oh, this feels painterly, mm -hmm. and in part because you captured the scene so uh, capably and precise, and in part this part what we were discussing about not being a voyeur accurately, so the, the, the whole sense of the thing, as much as one can do, of course, but um, honestly, for better lack of a better mm -hmm. word. And then you, you borrow terms from the visual arts, for example, diptych triptych, so on and so forth. So it, it does, does that, do you resonate with the visual arts? Does it feel important to you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think a lot about poetry as a kind of, through cinematic metaphors, thinking mm -hmm. about film, how a, uh, the kind of shot that a poem might open up with, how it jumps to another shot. Yep. Image is always something that, um, ever since I began to be interested in writing, has always been at the forefront mm -hmm. of my poetics. Um, I think I an image can do so much than just what the language in it is suggesting, right? Yeah. And an image contains so yeah. many ideas and thoughts and put you directly in a place for the reader to perceive, not just to be told yeah. what they're supposed to be feeling or thinking or understanding. Um, so yeah, I, I think a lot about how the visual figures into a poem. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're describing a lot of jump cuts, several. Over yes, over. absolutely. <laughs> That's a technique I, I am yeah, in love with. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Natasha, you were shaking your head in, in agreement. What do you, what's the job of image? Uh, yeah, I think Ginny just said it perfectly. <laughs> yeah. But it, that is exactly, I mean, it's, it's the, it's the uh, especially the, the visual image for me is the one that I, I mm -hmm. cleave most to. I begin yeah. there, even though, you know, the others are sort of working themselves in. Um, but it, it, it is, uh, for me, in writing a poem, if I can't, see it, if I can't mm -hmm. make that image of it, yeah. um, that scene, as you say, in, in, um, before animating it, the way that a photograph can move into being a film, yeah. then I can't write it. Mm -hmm. I have to begin there, too. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So I have a question, uh, maybe a contemporary question, or a current question would be a better way to say. How do you make sense of our current moment? I know this is a big question, but we're constantly... <laughs> <laughs> We're constantly distracted, right? We have a lot of information, a lot of access, a lot of stimuli, right? And yet, we're also insatiable. We're hungry for what is, as you say, underneath. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sense of those two, the schism, right? This, this overabundance and yet this hunger. How do we stay, how do we stay eye level? <laughs> Use Jenny's book. <laughs> Use your title. Wow, can we add another 20 minutes? Oh, yeah, right. Oh, no, I <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, I think about that constantly because I am always battling with my own attention, yeah. being overstimulated, yes. um, just oversaturated with knowledge, with what I have access to through something as simple as a small phone. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, writing and specifically, definitely poetry trains us to a different kind of attention. I mean, think about a poem, it does not, you know, we have line breaks, right? So you're not just reading and then yeah. just 
not thinking about how a line moves, right? There's constant stopping and starting and yeah. fragments. The language is so rich and heightened. And as soon as you finish a page, you can jump right back up and revisit again, right? So it's an, it, it asks of you to train and inhabit your intention in very different ways to slow it down, to pay attention to the particulars, to the image, to what lies both inside of the frame and outside of it. It becomes a whole experience in and of itself. So you know, that gives me a lot of hope when I mm. feel just completely scattered yeah. and also at the same time to feel completely filled up with all that there is, but also starved for something else, a different yeah. kind of way of being, a different kind of knowing that just being on your phone won't, you know, provide you. Mm -hmm. Well, I like any answer that basically says poetry. Poetry <laughs> is the answer. What do you think, Natasha? Well, I mean, listening to Jenny, I was thinking about um, one of the really important things that um, Tracy K. Smith mm -hmm. did, our nation's um, outgoing poet laureate, she really encouraged that kind of slowing down mm -hmm. um, that a poem yeah. permits. Mm -hmm. I think she got a lot of people to slow down mm -hmm. and, and to, to take in poems. Um, perhaps the evidence of that, I think, I think the NEA has statistics about this, but since 2012, mm -hmm. Um, the readership for poetry is Shut up. going up. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you make sense of that? Mm -hmm. That's the evidence right there. Yeah. People are hungry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and willing to slow down with a poem. Yeah. yeah. And see themselves reflected. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we have limited time, so I, I want to end by asking this question, which I often ask is, what do you listen for, both of you, in poetry? What keeps you attentive and your mind wrapped as you read others? I think I'm looking for new kinds of music, strange sounds, new arrangements of language. I think because poetry is so linguistically wild and inventive yeah. that arranging language in new ways lets you listen to what language can't capture. Yeah. The larger ineffable, the complexity okay. um, of, of an issue that you can't just pin down with language. But poetry has a way of bringing you close. Mm -hmm. I agree. Natasha, how about you? You know, when a poem is, um, really has me in its grip, mm -hmm. sometimes um, the music can wash over me mm -hmm. um, because I'm so focused instead on being transported to a very vivid and particular place through image. That's what it was like mm. listening to Jenny. Mm -hmm. To, you know, the seeing in yes. those poems was so precise yes, I that I could find myself there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the music is washing over me. I think sometimes, uh, also as Jenny said, I may notice something about um, the different combinations of sounds that yeah. are arresting um, before I even can grasp what else the poem is doing. Mm -hmm. So it is really some combination yes. of those two things, though. Yeah. Um, I know um, on a more sort of in the front of my brain that, that I am really attuned to uh, the visual, to the, mm -hmm. the precision and the, and the clarity of the seeing in a yeah. poem. Yeah. Well, thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. Guys, can we give them a big round of applause, please? Thank you.